Let me start. Every talk of this kind has to start with a picture of Descartes. I actually was looking at my slides this morning and I thought, why did I put Descartes in there? I can't exactly remember. But anyhow, every talk starts with Descartes because philosophers will tell you uh, that the account of the mind, the general assumptions about how we study the mind uh, in 2018 derived from Descartes' uh, important views. And I think that's true. And the one that's relevant for us is what philosophers um, typically call internalism. And internalism means various things, but what it means for us in, in this class is uh, the view that if you want to understand thought, you want to understand the mind, if you want to understand cognition, everything that's relevant is internal to that mind. Okay? Everything that you have to appeal to, everything that's causally relevant is going to be found in the mind itself, in the skull. Um, and uh, the basic idea I'm going to try to talk about today is the idea that that's not true. Right? That view is not adequate. Uh, in order to really understand mental life and in order to understand uh, the functioning of the brain and ultimately the function of the, of the brain in social contexts, we need to think about things that lie outside, outside the skull. Okay? Now, uh, the idea that we need to look outside the skull is by no means a new one. Um, even in modern history, uh, there are uh, lots of figures, both, both in philosophy and in psychology, who have advocated for one reason or another the idea that we need to look outside uh, the mind in particular in order to explain how the mind works. So, uh, sorry, or the brain for that matter. Sorry, I should have said uh, the modern version of internalism, of course, is that everything of interest is going to be explained in terms of the brain and we're going to going to get to this in due course. Um, one of the most interesting figures, the figures become a bit of a rock star um, uh, in contemporary uh, cognitive sciences, is a philosopher called Maurice Merleau-Ponty, a very, uh, a really interesting, very, very unusual thinker who I can recommend. He wrote a, a great classic called The Phenomenology of Perception, which is one of those, you know, I once heard um, very famous philosopher Derek Parfit talk about uh, what makes a great book in philosophy. And he says, you know, there's, there's two kinds of great books. There's the, the book that you read and you get to the end of it and you don't have a clue what it was all about, right? Then there's the other kind, which is you, you read it and you get to the end of it. You don't have a clue what it was all about, but you get a tingle. So if you read The Phenomenology of Perception, it falls into that latter category. And uh, Merleau-Ponty was actually quite interested in neuroscience, what was neuroscience of the day. He was interested in, uh, he wrote quite a bit about lesion patients, uh, particularly soldiers coming back from the First World War who exhibited these remarkable behaviors that no one had thought about systematically. Anyhow, Merleau-Ponty in The Phenomenology of Perception makes a great point about the idea that when we perceive things, we perceive things in a three-dimensional space, and in order to fully perceive them as we understand perception, we have to move around in that space. So at the very least, there's something about the fact that we are physical entities that move in a space that seems to be intrinsic to perception. So that idea, the idea that there's something outside the perceiving being, in this case space, uh, that's relevant for a complete theory of perception uh, is something that he talks a great deal about and provides a, a kind of paradigm example of something like what you might call context. So uh, this is a first pass at a, not a definition, philosophers never give definitions. Um, because they're always wrong by definition. Uh, so here's my kind of first pass at what context might be in the cognitive neuroscientist, uh, neurosciences. So context is, is any, anything, right, an object, a property, process, anything that lies outside the skull, that lies outside the brain, let's say, that somehow causally or uh, from the point of view of explanation, relevant understanding mental function. And I'm going to come back to this notion of causal or explanatory. What I mean roughly is this. So there are lots of things that lie outside our skulls that are relevant to what's happening inside our skulls. Right now, something going on inside your skull is being caused by the sounds that I'm making. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, whether the sounds that I'm making and the words that I'm saying and the meaning of those words is somehow essential to understanding brain function or your brain function is obviously not very plausible, right? If you had never heard uh, 
what I said just now, uh, any account of the brain that was adequate would be adequate to understanding your brain. Um, but there are certainly going to be things, categories of things, that have causal interactions, that cause states of our brains that are going to be relevant to understanding brain function. But I think in a way more interesting is the ex explanation component here. So what I really think is interesting to the notion of context is that there are going to be phenomena that have to be understood, right, that are part of an explanation of brain function in a, in a broad sense of brain function. It's that idea we'll, we'll get to. Anyhow, the, the gist of it's pretty clear, right? If you need to appeal to something outside the brain in some way that is important to understanding brain function or maybe cognitive function, then that's part of the context. It's context because it's not the brain. That's really all it amounts to. But I, as I suggested at the beginning, I think we have to say an awful lot about exactly how this is going to work. OK. Now, one of the more uh, systematic uh, studies of context these days is what's now being called 4E cognition. Um, and that's just the name that has been given by people working in the field to a whole range of approaches to understanding cognitive function, especially cognition, not so much neuro, uh, neural function, cognition especially, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, for thinking about context. I don't want to say, I don't think it's true that all there is to context is what the four E's refer to, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and I don't think the people who are advocating for e-cognition say that either. But uh, if you're interested in, co uh, uh, in context, broadly speaking, this is a kind of a coherent, systematic attempt to take account of, uh, of context. And if, if that book uh, uh, is, is just about to come out. I think it's coming out in a couple of months. And if you have a lazy $165 lying around, you can buy it. I think that's like 4000 for Canadians. OK, so, um, so 4E stands for four categories of phenomena, all, that's, all of which start with E, uh, that are supposed to point to categories of, uh, as I said, entities, uh, properties, processes that are somehow intrinsic to our understanding of cognition um, in, in different senses. Um, and these are pretty rough and ready, OK? So, as you might expect, picking four E's doesn't necessarily uh, mesh with you know, an attempt to be rigorous at, at categorizing things. This is a bit of a slogan. And what we'll do when we turn to real examples is try to say something more precise. So cognition is said to be embodied. Okay? So here's a little you know, toy example of an embodied cognition. When you count on your fingers, uh, we are, as Cartesians, inclined to say, well, you know, if you didn't have your fingers, you, you, you know, you'd be able to count. But it's not so clear that that's true. Kids really do seem to need their fingers when they're learning how to count. And uh, there's some evidence that when you use your body in that way, you really are adding something, right? Your fingers are acting as a tool for, for your mind. Um, and even though you might not need that tool, nonetheless, when it's acting as a tool, it really is, in some sense, a kind of scaffolding or uh, you know, some sort of support for cognition and therefore deserves in some sense to be identified with the uh, components of the cognitive process. So look, the general idea is if our bodies weren't the way they were, then our cognition wouldn't be the way it is and uh, we certainly make use of our bodily states uh, to, to think. Second E is embedded and so now we're moving out from the, from the environment that our brain lives in, namely the body, to the larger environment. And uh, as you can imagine, larger environment inc incorporates all sorts of things. So here's another little toy example. Uh, if you're a chef, you know, when you learned how to cook, uh, your mother, your father told you that, that the way to do this is to do the mise en place, right? So uh, if you try to remember all the ingredients um, that go into the dish, that's, tough. that's a tough memory problem, right? Uh, so the easy thing to do and the organized thing to do is to take all your ingredients and measure them out and then organize them spatially in the order you're going to use them, right? 
And what that does for you, <clears throat> apart from organizing the kitchen, is it, it takes a tough memory task, remembering a list of things, and converts it into an easy task because it's a perceptual task now, right? So if you want to know, sorry, I'm not supposed to step over the line. If you want to know what to start with first, you start with flour, and then you go to the milk because that's the milk is there, right? So, um, so what you're doing here, again, is you're using, in this case, uh, the spatial properties of the environment around you to, as philosophers and psychologists sometimes say, to offload a cognitive problem. So you take a tough problem, which is in your head, namely the problem of remembering a list of ingredients, and you, as it were, right, put it in the environment by organizing your environment spatially. Okay? Um, and so this is a, sort of a nice example. If you actually go and do this, you'll have the sensation, right? which represents the situation of suddenly having this tough problem be easier, right? You'll actually feel that you're not straining in the same way you were. So it's quite plausible if it's actually less demanding on your mind. It's quite plausible that the environment really is, in some sense, to be articulated, right? Participating in your cognition. Okay, third E is inactive. Inactive is a big fuzzy notion. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, characterize inactive as somehow involving uh, interaction and dependency, okay? So think of somebody at a cocktail party, um, having a conversation. There's a sense in which that person could speak the words that she's speaking in the order she's speaking them and over the time period she's speaking them. But it doesn't really make sense to look at one side of a conversation, right? Uh, and indeed, Producing that side of the conversation, in some sense, depends in a fairly subtle way on being attentive to what the other person is saying, right? So conversation, as people sometimes point out, is kind of improvisatory. You're engaged in uh, a back and forth, and what you do depends on what the other person just did. And if you're not attentive and sensitive to what they just did, then what you're doing doesn't make much sense. So the thought is somehow that certain kinds of cognition really depend essentially on other things happening in the environment. I mean, in this case, it's another person doing things, but it need not be such a thing, okay? So there's some notion of dependency, again, that would have to be articulated fairly specifically. There's some notion maybe of time that's gonna play a role frequently. Uh, um, and there's probably a range of things. But in any case, the idea here of an activity is the idea of a responsiveness of the mind or brain to features of the environment that somehow requires reference to that environment to make sense of what's going on. Okay? All right. I, I don't say that that's perfectly clear what I just said. Um, when we get to some examples, maybe it'll be clearer. Um, I think in general, by the way, I, uh, I'm not too fussed about uh, precise definitions because I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done first. What I'm going to hope is that when you see a case of inactivity, you know, like pornography, you know, you won't be able to define it, but you'll you'll know it when you see it. Okay. <laughs> All right. The fourth E uh, is extension, and extension actually falls into two categories. One of which is, uh, in a way, in a kind of funny way, one of which is both really, I think, kind of core to what a scientist should be thinking about. Uh, and the other, which is very close and yet is very far away from what any scientist is going to care about. And it's much more of a philosopher's, uh, philosopher's uh, adventure. But anyway, they're both very interesting. So let's start with uh, extended cognition. And this refers to, uh, I think, one of the papers I, I suggested you read, the paper by Ed Hutchins, who's an anthropologist. Um, uh, uh, Hutchins is actually very uh, interested in travel, uh, in the modes of travel, um, and so he actually does this remarkable ethnography of things like, like landing a plane, or um, he has a book, an entire book, written about uh, piloting a navy ship. Um, uh, so this is very interesting stuff. And so uh, if you read the paper, um, what you discovered is that accor according to Hutchins, the following thing is true. The standard account of how the mind works in 2018 is what's called computationalism, right? Is that familiar to everybody? So it, it's, it's the computer model of the mind. It says, in effect, that thinking is having symbols that get uh, manipulated by various operations, just like a computer. Now, 
whether you agree with that or not, take that as given, which is to say, take it as the standard account of the mind right now. What Hutchin says is there are, there are certain kinds of uh, behaviors, say like landing an airplane, such that if you write down in computational terms what has to be accomplished for the behavior to be successfully executed, in other words, here you are, the plane's flying up here, and there's some behavior or other, right, some series of computations that has to happen for the plane to be down there without crashing. If you write down those computational steps and you ask where those steps are carried out, the answer is in the cockpit as a whole and not inside the skull of any one of the pilots and not inside exclusively the space of any one tool or any one bit of technology, okay? So if you ask, who's carrying out the computation or what system is carrying out the computation that we call in ordinary behavioral terms landing an airplane, the answer is the cockpit, everything inside the cockpit. So the thought then is cognition, the thinking, the reasoning actually, in this case, right, doesn't only, isn't only restricted to one brain or one skull, it's not even restricted to two skulls, the pilot and the co-pilot. It actually spills out. That's actually a misleading metaphor, but kind of, kind of memorable. It sort of spills outside the skull of both pilots to include the tools and the, uh, the, um, the uh, other parts of the technology in the, in the cockpit. Okay? So the thinking, as it were, is happening in the cockpit as a whole. That's the idea. What's nice about this, if you haven't read that paper, I think of all the papers I gave you, that's the one I would, I would most uh, recommend. It's a really interesting paper. I think it's been quite influential. And what's so nice about it is that uh, you don't have to make any fancy philosophical assumptions, broad theoretical assumptions, other than your commitment to computationalism. It's not very controversial. Once you accept that, it's a, it's, you know, it's a very uh, uncontroversial view about um, what's happening that leads to this remarkable conclusion that somehow thinking is this disembodied process. Let me just pause here for a sec. I don't want to go too fast, right? As I said, I don't, I'm not invested in finishing. So are we okay? Yeah. yeah? All right. Okay. Now, a few, yeah. I'm just thinking of this cockpit example and um, compared to embedded cognition and inactive cognition. This sounds, it's actually a bit of both. It sounds like it's a bit of both. Good. So let me say one thing about this. I think the categories are fuzzy and overlap. No question about that. So let's ask, what's the difference between the inactive part and the extended part? One thing you might say here ab about this, this inactivity, you might, if you're in a kind of conservative frame of mind, you might say, well, look, uh, let's not get overexcited here, right? I mean, there's two people, and they each have a mind, in virtue of each having a brain, let's say. And while it's true that what one is doing is somehow responsive to or dependent on what the other is doing, so there is, a, there is something interesting happening. Everything of interest is still happening inside the skulls of these two people, right? There's no, you wouldn't want to say, oh, there's a single, pro you might say it, but you don't have to say, there's a single cognitive process happening here that somehow supervenes on, right, is, encompasses the two individuals as two components of a single system. Okay. The idea about extension is that that is what you want to say, that there's a sense in which the thinking uh, the thinking is happening 10,000 feet above any individual, what you might call a thinker, what we traditionally call a thinker, to encompass people, objects, processes, and so on outside the skull. Just two quick footnotes. So first of all, most people don't make hard distinctions between these things. They tend to go together and they represent progressive elaborations of the same framework. So you don't feel like, that, you know, it has to be this or it has to be that. This is fleshing out a, a more complete uh, picture. The other thing, though, is that I think you're describing inactivism from the point of your initial question about eternalism. 
Because in many conversations about enactments, when people emphasize this cognition is about action. So it's not so much about how you react to others, it's the idea that what you're actually trying to do is not go out the representation through a computation, you're trying to intervene in the world. So the point of a conversation is not, you know, what do I think about things, it's what do I say to you now? And that's the computational problem. So yep. that already shifts the whole discussion a little bit in a different direction. It does, and I think I think it's absolutely a fair point. I focused on the dynamical part because typically, so the uh, Merleau-Ponty is a classical inactivist, right? You see things, you act on the world, so on. One of the I was emphasizing one piece of that, um, which is this idea that you, you see something and you say, so you ha have a target, right? And how do you learn how so far away something is, right? So suppose you're a baby, right? You, you have some sort of distance perception, but how do you start to calibrate how far something is when it looks that way? Well, one obvious way to do it is to walk toward it and see how long it takes you. Um, so the kind of or in activist process, as you say, right, is, is action, where the action gives you feedback that somehow leads to further cognition. So I'm, so, I'm sort of emphasizing that dynamic, uh, that dynamic feature of of behavior according to which you're having a conversation with the environment. So I am trying maybe, maybe I'm trying to shove these things into make it a bit more unified than it is. But anyways, that's absolutely right. So I think this notion of action uh, is certainly part of it. If you look at say the work of somebody like Alva Noe, who is a very important uh, contemporary figure uh, in, uh, in this tradition who works on perception and other things, even he even claims that consciousness involves action in a certain kind of way. So anyhow, I, f I find that a little bit less plausible, but certainly in certain kinds of perceptual tasks, action certainly seems to be part of it. And of course, uh, the other thing that's important in what Lauren said is, there's also a kind of behind this idea, there's a kind of, you know, faux or rough evolutionary idea according to which thinking uh, is only useful in the grand scheme of things if it leads to more adaptive behavior, right? So according to, according to the framework for all of biology, namely evolutionary theory, you know, thinking for its own sake is of no value. Uh, if, if you think, but that doesn't change your behavior, then uh, evolution gets no purchase on that thinking. So in, in, in that sense, of course, uh, cognition has to be related to action in some way or other for us to make sense of it biologically. Okay, great. So, uh, that's extended cognition. Um, now, let me turn very briefly, because this is less important for us, but it's really fun, so uh, it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this case. So a very famous paper, 998, written by uh, Andy Clark and David Chalmers, two very influential philosophers of mind. Um, they take this idea of extended cognition and they extend it further. And I'll just give you the very famous example, which will give you the flavor of this idea very quickly. So uh, they, they have a little thought experiment uh, and the thought experiment goes like this. Uh, Inga is walking uh, uh, in Manhattan, and she sees a sign that says uh, there's, um, I can, can never remember who the artist is, but anyhow, there's an exhibit on at the Museum of Modern Art, and Inga is very interested in uh, this painter, and so knowing where she is, and knowing that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street, and 53rd Street is that way, she turns that way and she heads toward 53rd Street. Okay. Now, Otto is also walking through Manhattan, and he sees the same advertisement, and he thinks, yes, I'm interested in that painter. Uh, and so he also wants to go to that exhibit. But Otto is uh, suffering from dementia, and he can't remember things. Uh, and as a result, he started to keep a notebook. Hence, my notebook picture, right? There's my, there's my uh, visual. He keeps a notebook where he writes down things that he are important to him that he can't remember, like the MoMA is at, on 53rd Street. And so, knowing that he's where he is and that 53rd Street is there, he turns and walks toward 53rd Street. Now, here's the claim. The function of Otto's notebook in his mental economy is identical to the function of Inga's memory, which is in her brain. Uh, Throw in a few basic assumptions that are uncontroversial, Clark and Chalmers say, and what you get is that Otto's notebook, when it functions in the way it just did, is actually part of Otto's mind. 
in just the way as we want to say that Inga's memory, long-term memory, is part of her mind. And it's irrelevant that the memory is located in a bit of neural tissue inside a brain or that it's located on a piece of paper in a notebook outside the brain. As long as the function is the same, as I say with certain philosophical assumptions, you get, uh, you get the claim that that thing under certain circumstances is part of the mind. And so it's not just thinking that leaks out outside your skull in the way that Hutchins advocates. The mind itself is not located inside your skull, according to these, these folks. Okay? So even though your brain is inside your skull, your mind is not, or at least not always. So that's the extended mind. And as I say, I think this kind of case should be taken very seriously by scientists. This is not a scientific uh, a claim, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and so you can, um, you can give that some thought if you want. OK. Um, now, so that's, uh, those are some examples, intuitive examples, of what you might think of as context in the sense that I characterized it. They're states, processes, entities that lie outside the skull that are in one way or another that I've mostly just hand-waved at, essential to understanding mental function, and so part of the context of mental function. Now, just an observation to get to the start to move toward our topic, some of this context isn't social, right? I mean, it's the hand or, or this stuff or a notebook, and some of it is social, namely other people, and some of it is both, right? So if you're landing a plane, if you're the pilot, then some of the context of what you're doing is the other pilot, co-pilot, and some of it is the, uh, is the other stuff in the cockpit. All of it is, is essential to uh, make sense of what it is that you're doing. OK? So somehow or other, we're, 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 you know, we're headed for this notion of social context. But that's only really one category. It just happens to be a very important one for human beings, because human beings are, are social animals. OK, any questions about that? That's the end of that bit. No? OK. So let me turn to a couple of examples of things that are seem to me examples of social context in real science rather than in the sort of uh, hand wavy examples I just gave you. This is, it's sort of a, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a very busy uh, figure, but I'll, I'll give you the, yeah. Sorry, I, I just, uh, I do have a question about the social and the non-social. So by non-social, you're meaning that are not, um, do not involve, the context does not involve any interaction with other people. Well, I, what I mean is, we'll see in a second that interaction isn't necessary. What I mean is that the part of the context, right, the part of the thing that's somehow relevant to understanding mental life uh, is social if that part is a person. I suppose it could be an animal too, but for simplicity, a person. And it's not social if it's not. But as we'll see in a second, you don't have to be interacting with that person for that per for another person to be part of your cognitive context. And wouldn't you accept the other argument that it could be an inanimate object, but it has a social history, a social yes. fashion, and it reminds you of these ah. things? So therefore, in a sense, it is social. I mean, even that book, yeah, you, you have to learn how to write, and you're writing in a couple of Sure, I, I think um, I, I'm not fussed about that. I don't have any views about that. Um, uh, I don't think, so far, I can't see that it matters. If you want to count, uh, you know, if, if um, you know, in some uh, Helen Fisher, you know, is an anthropologist who does these very interesting brain imaging studies of, of, of new love, of passionate love. Do you know, do you know her? She's a bit of a, a celebrity. Um, and she describes these experiments, you know, where she asks people to come in with an object. So they're all, they're, these are all, for those of you who don't know this, she's an anthropologist. I think she's at Rutgers. And she, she's interested in what's going on in your brain when you fall in love or when you get dumped. And um, she's interested in the distinction between that first phase of love and the sort of, you know, that first few months and then the everything that comes after, right? Which, you know. OK, so, um, so, uh, so she does these experiments where she asks people who have just fallen up to bring in, you know, I don't know what, uh, 
you know, something that is associated with their beloved, and, and, and they bring them in. She describes them, they bring them in like, you know, like religious icons. And indeed, um, th those objects evoke in, in brain state something like what you might expect a person to evoke. So if you want to count that as social, that's okay by me. Um, I actually, interestingly, uh, again, uh, I haven't worked this out fully. I don't think it matters. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I mean, the t Lawrence suggested this topic, social context and social neuroscience. So that's what I'm talking about. But I think it's context, which is really the, uh, you know, so the social part, of course, is very important, as I say, because human beings are social animals. And I do, of course, I agree that uh, two things, that social context is bound to be more important in general. And of course, if you're interested in social neuroscience, which is what this class is about, then it's bound to be the social world. That's the predominant part of the context. But to me, uh, thinking about the nature of mental function and neural function, it's the idea of context, which I think is the, the kind of radical one. So I'm not, I don't mind too much, I think. Uh, at least that's my position now. I, I, I'm totally happy to be persuaded otherwise. Anyway, so that's, that's very helpful. Um, uh, I suppose, I mean, it certainly does explain, right, why we hang on to objects uh, in certain ways, why objects have significance for us, and so on. Yeah. It, pres it presumably ex may even explain particular phenomena of interest. I don't know, fetishes or something. It may, may explain actual uh, behaviors in a way that we couldn't explain any other way. Yeah. Good. OK. Uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about social context. Uh, so I, don't worry too much about this illustration. It's from a, a, uh, a study that's actually a bit controversial, I gather, but um, it's a study I admire enormously. Um, uh, and it's a study in the theory of mind, which, as you know, is uh, the capacity that human beings have to think about other people's mental states. And uh, one of the interesting questions, and here actually this, this touches on something that I myself I'm interested in for what it's worth. It doesn't add anything really, but um, uh, there's a bit of a debate about whether when you think about other people's mental states, you have to kind of do this very deliberately and consciously, right? So if you ask, you know, if you point, if Lawrence pointed to someone, pointed to Connie and said, what's Connie right now? What's she thinking? You know, I don't know. I might have to, I know Connie a little bit and I might have to work at it and so on. But number of people, I suppose including me, think that there, even though we do do that, there's also this other capacity for theory of mind, which probably happens very fast and automatically and effortlessly and unconsciously, because right now, uh, you know, uh, I have to keep track to a little bit, a little extent of what you guys are thinking and feeling. Right? If I start to see that you're getting bored or that you're looking puzzled, you know, I have to I have to respond to that as a lecturer. But of course, if I pay a lot, I mean, there's a lot of people in the room. If I start paying attention to what everyone's looking like, I'm not going to be able to think about what it is I'm trying to say. So in, in ordinary social interactions, we probably do keep tabs on what other people are thinking and feeling, maybe not very precisely, but we do it kind of off to the side. Anyhow, this study shows that something like that probably is right. And the study is incredibly elegant. It's very, very simple. A participant is shown a bunch of cartoons. And uh, in the cartoon, you see a ball rolling behind a wall. right? So there's a little video, a sequence of pictures. And the ball rolls behind a wall. And sometimes you can see the ball, and sometimes you can't see the ball. And your task as a participant in this experiment is just to press the button when you see the ball. So it's a straight perceptual task, incredibly simple per perceptual task. Now, the interesting thing is, as you see, here, I'll, I'll, I'll use the high-tech thing. There, there's a little man in, a, in, a, in many of these pictures okay, who's also watching the ball from a different perspective because he's off to the side. The little man is never mentioned. You're not interacting with the little man. You're never asked anything about the little man. You're not supposed to say anything about what you think is going on with him. What the experiment shows, though, apparently, is that the reaction time of the person doing this as a participant is dependent on what the little man sees. Okay? So in a context when the little man sees the ball, right, it's easier, it's, you, you are faster to say, I see the ball. And when the little man doesn't see the ball, it's, you're slower when you see the ball. Now what this seems to show, incidentally, according to this study, uh, infants do the same thing. They show the same behavior. So what the study seems to show is, even when you're not explicitly paying attention to another person in your environment, and when nothing about that person matters to the behavior you're exhibiting, 
it's as if the presence of that person initiates a process that we call theory of mind, where you start to keep track of what they're thinking, or at least in this case, something like what's going on from their perspective. And if this turns out to be right, then what that shows is that in order to understand the cognition of the participant, you have to be aware of the fact that there's another person in their environment. So, so just to say that a, a more minimalist and activist account of this would not say that you have a theory of what's going on. They would say that the presence of that other person changes how you look at that environment. And you can then conclude that you know, that could be construed as now, you know, you do that because that's where that person's looking, so maybe that's more important and you should look at it. So, but the account would not invoke this, this more general notion of the theory of would just say, this is changing your potential disposition. Sure. So uh, that may be right. Uh, I suppose I don't remember all the controls they did, so I, I can't say for sure. But yeah, you'd have to look at, look at controlling for this in other ways. So you could presumably, so if you imagine, for example, it's something about attention, you can imagine manipulating the attention of the participant without there being a human being precisely to get at that sort of issue. So you may be right. So um, uh, th there may be more conservative uh, interpretations of this. Um, and uh, what's interesting about that is this may be a case where, in the end, maybe it isn't social context. Maybe it isn't the presence of a person. Maybe you could get the same effect by indicating something important in some other way, right? Yeah, but I, again, the, the enactment, uh, enactment account, I'm thinking of Dan Buto and the way he would construct a more minimalist account of this. It's not to say that it isn't important that it's a person. It's to say that what's important about the person is that the way in which we are either wired or learned early on, that where a person is attending should guide or does guide, you know, no one should, it's not specific, guides our attention. Ah, but that's, see, that's not, sorry, I misunderstood then. That's not going to work in this case because according to the data, the pattern of responses depends on what is in the mind of that person. So it's not just that they're looking, but it's whether from their perspective, you can't see this, there's a three-dimensional arrangement here, whether from their perspective they can see the ball that you're also attending to. So you have to know, you have to calculate, computer, whatever, that right now, even though that person's in the same position, something is going on perceptually with them. So their mere presence and attention is not enough here. So it's not just where they're looking. It's the no, it's what they see. It's what they actually see. Yeah, thank you. That, so I'm sorry that wasn't clear. That actually makes all the difference. Yeah. Do they compare Anna. the presence of the person with non-presence of the person and then where they look and where they look? Do they consider that extra variable? Uh, again, I, I can't remember all the controls. The, uh, it's only the sort of crucial result, which is the, what the, whether the, the cartoon figure sees the ball or doesn't see the ball that seems to be the, the crucial factor. And I guess your point is well taken because this is where the debate resides, right? Is around what level of theory is needed. If you have to build a theory to make sense of what's going to be more, can it be just dispositional things that are manipulated by few social yeah. or otherwise? Yeah, so look, there could be various things going on here. I think this is quite interesting and important. So if it turned out, right? that you do another experiment, you do control, and you get some interesting effect merely by the fact that the person's there, then you might say, okay, so that's another kind of context, right? The presence of a person does something to you, or maybe, as Lawrence is suggesting, the presence of a person who seems to be paying attention, right? You know, and that, of course, kids do that from very, very early on. They look where their mother's looking. Um, or is it something more elaborate? So th there could be various things here. I, I choose this just because I happen to like, uh, I like this experiment very much. Um, and as I say, I particularly like, I like the fact that it, it, works, it works for our topic very nicely, I think, assuming the results are right, because it shows that you don't have to be interacting, right? It's, uh, it's, this is not a case where a person is like, is like the, the, the tools in the cockpit, where you're using that person, right? It's, this is not like an old couple that know, uh, know what the other person knows and, and depend on the other person for all sorts of things. Um, it, this is not a basketball. I, have, I, have a, I had a wonderful PhD student who was a, a big fan of basketball, and she, she had this idea for a while of looking at the, the cognition of the team in the way that Hutchins uh, looks at, at the cognition of two, two pilots, of the behavior being getting the, the ball from one end of the court to the other in a way that seems to be more or less automatic and dynamic and fluid and so on, even though nobody knows what the other person is thinking explicitly. Anyhow, so there, um, 
what's nice is that this is the mere presence of the person initiates what looks like a certain kind of cognition. Person is looking at the ball, so isn't that a form of interaction, unspoken interaction, since you both are sharing a task? Yeah, it's look. It's possible, I suppose, that uh, uh, that even though it's not part of the instructions in the experiment, that that may be some sort of assumption that pe that participants are making. It is possible. Um, so you know, I don't know. I don't say that this the interpretation the authors offer is the absolutely right one, um, and. Uh, it, um, but even so, right, it seems to me that the very fact that the presence initiates some assumption about a joint activity, I think, yeah. is, is interesting. Yes, yeah, Samuel. Could I briefly assist you with another example? Because some people in the room may or may not know that in the inactivist camp, there are people who are staunchly interested in denying that there are such things as mental states and that we as humans have each other's mental states. And they want to say that it's only a culture bound Western thing. But Michael Tomasello uses an effort example to illustrate the same thing and he says imagine uh, a 15 month old or a two year old who watches someone that they don't know drop their wallet they pick up the wallet and they give it to them so this doesn't just show that you know intrinsic altruistic behavior but the child understands that the person walking has a false belief to the extent that they believe they have a wallet you know in their pocket the wallet falls and he gives it back to them mm -hmm. now how do you explain this scenario without uh, the notion of, of mental states and mentalizing uh, i'm not sure right right interesting yeah, well, yeah, no, that's very interesting. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, other other questions? Well, maybe Great. again, I'll just, just more for pedagogical purposes. So I just have to refer to Dan Muto and with, um, uh, with Eric Hines in a series of books on what he calls radical and activist uh, cognitive science. So the attempt is to describe these complex behaviors not as uh, driven by mental representations and plans and theories, but as a sequence of contingencies, you know, the kind of interactions you're talking about, they're action-oriented and arguing, this is what we learn. When we learn, we learn how to tell stories, for example, in exactly this way. And I think that it actually makes very good sense ontogenetically. I mean, where does this more elaborate capacity come from? I think his very austere version of these theories is not an activist which what we do as adults when we have lots of resources and lots of theories and lots of models and we're using various things. But if you say, how does this process get jump-started with a very young, pre child? And I think the very minimalist account they try to give of how, how you can learn a series of actions that are essentially context-dependent and modeled by people around you that don't involve a lot of theories of what's going on is actually more plausible than the theory of the Right. Stuff to right, I think that's right. Good. Okay. Um, maybe for reasons of time. Uh, oh no, I'll mention. Does everyone know this famous experiment, the Good Samaritan experiment? Do, who doesn't know about it? Okay, so you're in a minority. So too bad. Uh, I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll do it, do it. It's interesting. Really. Okay. Well, I, I'm just. Yeah. All right. So this is another very famous example of social context. Um, so, uh, and this is often, this experiment is often used as a, a kind of paradigm of what uh, social psychology has been doing for, for many decades. So this is an experiment uh, done uh, at the Princeton Theological Seminary, and the participants were all seminarians. Uh, and the seminarians uh, are, are brought into a room and they're told that as part of their training, they're going to have uh, a short period to prepare a little sermon. Uh, and then they're going to give the sermon in front of another group of uh, uh, another group of advisors, and the theme of their sermon is the Good Samaritan. Okay, um, and so uh, the seminarians are given half an hour, and they have to give this sermon, and then of course they're divided up into two groups, and one group is told uh, we have to go down that to the other building in order to, for you to, to meet the committee where you're going to give the sermon. And gosh, we're really late. and We really better get on it. And they're rushed. And the other group isn't rushed. Uh, and uh, here's what happens. When you, um, you take the rushed group and you walk them down the other building, they encounter uh, collaborators of the experiment, of the experimenter, well, one in particular, who's lying clearly injured on the on the uh, side of the path between the, the building where the seminarians are in and the building where they're due to give their, 
sermon. Um, and uh, bear in mind, right, they're thinking about the Good Samaritan. That's what they're thinking about right now. <laughs> And they encounter someone who's in need of help. And when they're rushed, they actually literally step over one of, you know, they step over this person on the way to, on the way to give their sermon. And the, the seminarians who are not rushed, of course, stop and help the person who's in need of help. And the, the, the finding here is supposed to be this. Uh, when you're uh, under pressure, uh, you are likely not to pay attention to things that you would pay attention to otherwise. Now, more broadly, of course, what this means is when the environment is configured in such a way, namely other people you know, are expecting you and there are certain kind of social norms about how you ought to behave, and particularly when you're a student and they're the professors and so on, uh, your behavior is going to be directed in one way and when you're not, you're not. And this is an example, broadly speaking, what social, social psychology has been showing in one experiment after another for decades um, in the sense that we normally think, as good internalists, right, that all of the explanatory resources uh, we need to, to, to articulate an answer to the question, why did Lawrence do what he did, are in Lawrence's head, in particular Lawrence's personality, his, his virtues, his vices, and so on. At least that's in Western culture. Um, but that, in fact, a lot more of the explanation of why Lawrence did what he did really lies in the, in the context, right? In, in uh, in the social and, in fact, other features of the environment that are demanding certain kinds of action on his, on his part. OK, so that's, it's a lovely experiment. It's, it's an old experiment now, and uh, I recommend it. By the way, this, this um, sorry, just one sec. This, this, uh, this idea, this so-called mistake of, it, of uh, identifying features of things inside your mind, especially your personality, as explanations of your behavior, that's usually called the fundamental attributional error. Right, so we, we attribute the motivations to you rather than to, your, to the environment. Yeah, go ahead. So can I ask a, a question about um, maybe naive ideas about the, the true self? Because it, it seems to me that many people would be like, they say, you know, humans are very altruistic and given an ideal set of condition, the true nature comes out and they will help. When the conditions are, are not right, then, then they won't help. But could we also just say that there is no true self outside of what the context affords or even demands, and that's, that's all there is? That's, I think that's probably, well, it may be true. I think that would be too strong a claim to make on the basis of just this kind of experiment. Though there is, um, there is the view, uh, it's actually a, a very famous paper written by my PhD supervisor, Gilbert Harmon, um, who, who argues that what social psychology shows is that there, there's nothing like personality traits. I mean, so he, he actually takes the most radical interpretation. And as a result, he argues that since there are no personality traits and virtues, so-called virtues as philosophers conceive of them, are personality traits, then virtue theory as applies to ethics makes no sense. So he thinks that a certain kind of ethical characterization of human behavior is incoherent because what social psychology shows is that that nature, that part of ourself, namely, or that way of characterizing ourselves, namely in terms of, you know, courageous, shy, or whatever, that those those features don't exist. They're all inventions. So we've been in, uh, several times already in the last day and a half, arriving at this point in this historical moment, also in social psychology, the most challenging personality mm. psychology. And we've had several representations saying, well, we're a bit beyond that now. We recognize there are phenomena on both sides, contextual personality traits, but they interact. So we always have to describe the context, describe the interaction to actually have any clear to that. Yeah. Both of them show. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think. Uh, I, I don't as a, I don't have an official view about about this. Um, what's so nice about this really is just you know, even if you get the thin edge of the wedge in, clearly uh, in Western culture anyhow, thinking about behavior, explaining behavior, uh, is much you know the way we do it is much too constrained. Okay, so uh, that's the end of of social context. Let me now narrow this a little bit or refocus it to talk about context in neuroscience. And here's where, in a way, it gets more interesting because I think the stuff I've just been talking about it's not all that controversial. Um, uh, it's really I, I, I reviewed it by way of uh, you know pedagogy. Um, where I think it gets more interesting is whether any of this applies to understanding brains. Okay. Uh, so brains, after all, unlike minds, are physical objects. And you might think that it's one of the virtues of neuroscience that it is the study organized around understanding how a particular object works. And that's 
makes it in a certain way easier, maybe, than thinking about how the mind works. But I think uh, it, to the extent there's a take-home message of this lecture, it's that in order to understand how brains work, you need to appeal to context every bit as much. That's why this lecture is called The Situated Brain. Um, so let me take a, a, an example as a way of motivating this from visual neuroscience. So um, everybody here probably, well, I'm sure you know roughly that neurons, many neurons, let's take visual neurons, right? So nobody knew how neurons worked until roughly Hubel and Weasel. Does everyone know who Hubel and Weasel were? No. Yeah, okay. No? Okay, so uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel were physiologists working in the 60s who uh, were students or postdocs of somebody who was one of the early uh, people actually taking electrophysiological measurements of neural activity. Um, and so you'd put an electrode next to a neuron or in a neuron, and you'd see, you'd, you'd track its electrical behavior, but uh, it would sort of, you know, so you, when, you, when you do this in a lab, you sort of hear a little sound, right? You, you, uh, you magnify the sound, you, hear a little, you turn the electrical thing into sound, and you hear, you know, you hear a little thing. Um, and so the, these neurons would, would be active, but the great mystery was what made them active, right? What made this neuron suddenly leap into action and fire an action potential? Nobody knew. Um, and then in a very famous bit of scientific serendipity, uh, Hubel and Weasel were, were so they, they had a cat, an anesthetized cat that was, had its head on a little a little metal plate, and, and they had an electrode in its head, and they had a screen where they were projecting images in an effort to, and actually I heard Hubel talk about this. Hubel, by the way, did his MD at McGill. He's one of McGill's great. He's an Ontarian who, who did his MD at McGill. Um, anyways, Hubel tells this story, but you know, we were taking a magazine and moving it back and forth. We were trying to figure out what it is that this neuron was interested in. And then he, he took a slide. In the old days, you know, there were glass slides that you would stick in the projector that had something on it. And they noticed that the slide made this particular neuron suddenly fire. And they, they looked at what was on the slide, tried another slide, and they couldn't do it. And eventually they figured out that it wasn't what was on the slide, but it was the, the edge of the slide moving across into the projector that was generating this spontaneous activity on the, not spontaneous, responsive activity to the to the neuron. Um, and so I'm going to have to step across. Sorry, I hope this is OK. What they discovered is that, uh, I'll, I'll do it here. What they discovered is that um, different neurons preferred, in the sense were most responsive to, bars moving uh, at a particular angle in a particular direction, right? So here's a neuron that likes a bar at 45 degrees moving in that direction. Um, and uh, that was how, in a certain way, modern visual neurophysiology was, was started because it, 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 uh, it revealed that neurons are highly specific, that what neurons respond to can be uh, a very, very, very narrow set of stimuli. Here's a neuron, right, that is not even interested in moving bars, right? It's in only interested in uh, a bar at this angle moving in that direction. And so there began, right, from the 60s, a kind of enormous explosion in visual neurophysiology, much of which, maybe most of which, is devoted to putting an electron next to a neuron and trying to figure out what that neuron likes. And it turns out it likes all sorts of things. There, are, you probably know, right, there are studies now that, at least one study that claims to have shown that, uh, found a neuron that likes, uh, what's her name? What's her name? Jennifer Sorry? Was it, no, it was, um, anyways, somebody like Jennifer Aniston, right? So a single neuron that only responded to Jennifer Aniston, and lots of Jennifer Aniston, right? Jennifer Aniston front on and thought on. So not just that face, but that person, right? This is any human being. This is a finding from some years ago. Um, so, okay, and this is still an ongoing business. So this is an example. So here's a famous of, uh, neuron of Hubel and Weasel. This is a, a, neuro, a neuron interested in color, um, something I worked on for many years. So this is a neuron that, this is not what the neuron looks like. This is a representation of the part of space and the stimulus. So if the neuron is looking here at this part of space, if it shines, if you shine a green light here, it reacts and uh, it likes it. Where is it? You shine a green light here, likes it a little bit. You shine a red light in the middle, likes it a lot. And so it looks like here's a neuron that is interested in some sort of contrast, red-green contrast. And indeed, these are neurons that are supposed to have generated a certain uh, visual structure. Anyways, a long story. The gist of it is there's very precise responses on the part of neurons. Now, 
Okay. What uh, the neuron likes, right, is known as its receptive field, very roughly speaking. So the receptive field, it's actually more than what it likes. So in this case, the receptive field is that part of space that the neuron is attending to and a particular stimulus in that part of space. That is the, if you, if you say uh, what that is, then you are saying, uh, you are describing the receptive field of that neuron. So this is a neuron that has a so-called center surround structure. It likes one thing in the middle, it likes a different thing on the, on the, uh, on the outside and so on. That is the fundamental concept of all of perceptual neuroscience. It's a big deal, the receptive field. Now here's the really interesting thing. Uh, yeah, well, let me, I'll get to this in a minute, uh, if there's time. Here's, oh, wow, uh, okay. I always say that I have no investment in finishing, and then I discover that I'm lying, that I do want to finish, I do want to get to, okay. Um, uh, here's the interesting thing. The, notice how I describe the receptive field. I said, it's that part of space that the, re, that the neuron is responding to, and a particular kind of stimulus in that part of space, yeah? In other words, I'm describing the functional properties of this neuron. I'm saying the most important thing but what this neuron does by making reference to the environment, right? There's no other way to do it. You can, you can uh, classify neurons anatomically, right? They're neurons with different shapes and different, uh, different structures. And you can classify them in terms of their neurotransmitters and in terms of their ion channels. There are lots of uh, physiological methods for, for lumping neurons together. But if you want to know at least what a perceptual neuron is doing, there is no other way at the moment than to talk about its response to the external world, OK? So that's an example of what you might think of as a kind of, I mean, I, uh, I think of it as an activity, even though um, action is not particularly uh, immediately implicated, because there's a kind of interaction between the world and the environment, the, the, between the, the brain and the environment. The, the f uh, characterization of the neuron depends on our understanding of what's in the environment. Now notice, right, um, I, sa I said before that context involves causal or explanatory uh, features, and I think here you have both, right? So if I talk about the center surround structure, I'm saying something causal, which is if you shine a red light here, some causal process will be initiated. But I'm also explaining, right, my theory makes reference to this concept of receptive field, even if particular neuron never exhibits a particular causal response. So there's something uh, theoretically important about the environment merely to the articulation of what these neurons do. I don't know if that, that helps get at the distinction, but anyhow, I think it's there. Okay, so that's a kind of fundamental story about something we really do understand. I mean, this is a part of neuroscience to the extent that we understand anything in neuroscience, this is what we understand. We understand uh, fundamental perceptual, particularly visual, visual function. Um, now, here's the really remarkable thing. So Hubel and Weasel, won the Nobel Prize in the 1980s for work that really was staggeringly important. It turns out, though, that much of that work might not have been quite right, or it was limited. So in the 1990s, people started to do their experiments again under different conditions. So as I said, in the original experiments, right, cats were, uh, cats were either unconscious, literally anesthetized, or they were immobilized. And you might expect, and this is kind of the kind of an activity that Lawrence was referring to, you might expect that an animal that's unconscious, right, is not necessarily going to show neural responses that uh, are uh, the neural responses that the brain is, as it were, normally, uh, normally uh, uh, revealing. So people started to do experiments where they let animals move, right? And they also started doing experiments where instead of showing them uh, bars, which are, after all, not terribly naturalistic stimuli, they started showing them pictures like this. This is, it's hard to see, but it's just a bunch of people and some trees in the background. And what they found was that the neurons, the very neurons that Hubel and Weasel were looking at in the first visual area, V1, behaved completely differently when they were functioning in, as it were, normal conditions. Uh, conditions of consciousness, movement, and in response to naturalistic images. They functioned completely differently. Um, and in much more complicated ways. And in particular, the receptive field changed. So it turns out that the receptive field of the very same neurons, 
varies uh, as a function of the statistics of the image, which is to say uh, how complicated it is. It depends on what's happened prior, right? What, so the neuron has a history of behavior, of action, and it's also uh, dependent, as you might expect, on what the world looks like. So it's as if, this is, again, the inactive part, that I, uh, the, the kind of inactivity I had in mind before, right? It's as if the neuron is in conversation with the world, and the world is saying, this is how I am, so you have to adopt this way of functioning, okay? So it's not that there's anything wrong with this. I mean, it's not the normal way in which a cat, uh, and some, not, human weasel didn't, didn't discover things that weren't true. It's just that what they discovered was, was very, very restricted to a very unnatural set of circumstances. And so a good deal of the neural, uh, neuron functioning uh, wasn't, wasn't part of the data. But in a way, this is necessary to make the very point, right? If you have an immobile cat responding to this very simple stimulus, the environment and the cat, cat's body, says to the neuron, in effect, respond in this way. Right? And then you put that same neuron in a different environment, and the env environment, as it were, gets the neuron, however it does it, gets the neuron in a different state, and the neuron's behavior is different. Okay, so that seems to be a very, very clear example of the way in which the environment, the context of neural functioning, and this is individual neurons, right? Very specific, uh, is both causally relevant and also theoretically relevant to understanding neural function. If you don't understand what's going on in the environment, then you have no way of describing uh, the function of V1 neurons. Okay? So a textbook account of V1 neurons that doesn't mention the environment is not theoretically adequate. That's a bad textbook. That's my point. Okay? Okay. So was that clear? That was maybe, that was reasonably fast. Um, I, I want to make sure that that's clear because it seems to me this is not very controversial stuff. This is stuff, but it's very radical, okay? It, it gives us a very different picture uh, of, uh, of neural theory, of, of, of neuroscience and neural function. Are we okay? Okay. I'm going to skip this bit. Um, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll just give you the bottom, the take-home message. So uh, I'm, I, I work a little bit on... Um, on, on psychosis, schizophrenia, and other uh, mental uh, disorders um, that exhibit primarily delusions and hallucinations. And one of the things that's been known for a long time but um, is not very much represented in mainstream psychiatry, uh, you have to come to a place like McGill to learn about these things, certainly North American psychiatry, is that um, we know quite a bit about the social conditions as they relate to schizophrenia, even schizophrenia. And uh, they have a very robust effect on schizophrenia. It's very surprising, right? Schizophrenia with bipolar disorder is usually described as, usually characterized as the or biological illness, right? To the extent that psychiatric disorders have a biological underpinning, schizophrenia is the paradigm. And yet, I'm inclined to say, I mean, Lawrence may correct me, but I actually think we know more about the social causes or the social risk factors associated with schizophrenia even than we do about the physiological ones, the genetic ones, and so on. Uh, we still don't have a gene or a set of genes for schizophrenia. We still don't know what a schizophrenic brain looks like, really. Uh, but we do know three things. We know that childhood adversity, being an immigrant or the child of an immigrant, uh, and living in a city uh, or a populated area are all robustly associated with the risk of schizophrenia. And in fact, uh, say, let's take the urban environment, living in uh, Sao Paulo, say, compared to living in Burlington, probably more than doubles your risk of schizophrenia. Even being born in Sao Paulo and living there through your teenage years is enough probably to double the risk of schizophrenia. And that's the same increase in risk as you get from abusing cannabis, okay, which is a significant risk factor associated with schizophrenia. So it's very, it's very well established and it's very big. Uh, by the standards of risk factors for schizophrenia. So why am I telling you this? Well, because obviously the social world is having some downstream effect on the brain to make the brain more vulnerable. And um, as far as I know, I'll just skip ahead. It's the only study that I know of, uh, I, I may have missed uh, something more recently, that shows a direct relationship between the city that you're born in and the city that you grew up in and brain activity. Uh, so roughly what this study did was it uh, asked participants to do a task um, that stressed them, 
and then it uh, uh, did, uh, took an image of the brain under stress, and it found that um, regions of the brain, in particular the, the PACC and the amygdala, were differentially responsive as a function of the city that you grew up in, at least lived until you were 15. Uh, that, that's the PACC. That, was, that varied, and the amygdala varied with the city that you were currently living in. And by city, I mean population. Okay? So the number of people that you're living in interact in some way with, uh, with stress states. I'll, I'll just mention one thing, because this is one of the things I'm really interested in. Um, so city size affects your risk of schizophrenia. Notice that if you're living in Sao Paulo, there are, so there are, let's say, 20 million people in Sao Paulo. The number of people you ever meet relative to 20 million is approximately, you know, approximately zero, right? I mean, round it off to a whole number, it's zero. Because the people that you interact with is a tiny, tiny fraction of the population. Same if you're living in Montreal or Burlington, right? You're interacting roughly with the same number of people, a couple of hundred, probably. So here's the real mystery. The number of people in your environment, the vast majority of whom you never meet, you never see, you never interact with in any way, their presence raises your risk of schizophrenia. So there's another example of something like the mere presence of people. Now, of course, it's not their mere presence. You have to know something about their presence. But you never interact with them, right? So something's going on in your head that depends on their being there, uh, even though uh, they're not even in your environment in any way that's perceptible. OK, so that's an example of social uh, so in the case of neurons, we were talking about context, physical uh, uh, properties of stimuli as context for neural function. Now we're talking about the social world as a causal uh, part, of the, uh, part of the causal context in, uh, in psychosis. Yeah. I think your comment is interesting and the, the results you described are interesting. Um, but how do you know that the people were not perceptible? Because you know, you can be in a city, not talk to anyone, but you feel the noise, right? You feel or you get the information, you hear the news. It's different from being, you know, weekend on the countryside where no one is around. So, and that noise, or even information through news can cause, or, or even through email can cause stress. And stress is a known factor that can help trigger onset of psychiatric disorders. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So there's quite a bit to say about this. I'll just give you a couple of things that are relevant. So uh, it's misleading to put this as everyone does and as I did in terms of city versus non-city because the risk associated, um, the, the risk of schizophrenia is nearly a linear function of population and indeed population density. So it's continuous. So let's take an example. Let's compare somebody, right? So twins, identical twins separated at birth. One's in New York and one's in Sao Paulo. Now, I take it, I've never been to Sao Paulo, but I assume that the noise and the fuss and the hustle and bustle and so on in Sao Paulo is not twice as great as it is in New York. But the risk is twice as great. So in general, you're right, but it doesn't account for the nuances of the data. Now, you're quite right, though, that the kind of things you're mentioning, like seeing people that you never meet, seeing people you never really interact with, could be relevant. Um, but I think that, and in fact, it's one of the things I'm interested in. I think it's not gonna, it's not gonna do the job though, because um, if you walk around Mile End, for example, I don't know if you're in Montreal, if you walk around Mile End, it's a quite a dense neighborhood, one of the densest in, in the vicinity. But, uh, and, and no doubt the people who grew up there and live there probably have a slightly higher risk of psychosis to everyone else in Montreal, but the risk is more like the rest of Montreal, you know, not, not like the risk in New York. I have no explanation. I, this, is a, this has been a puzzle since 19, roughly 1939. And what psychiatry and epidemiology has been doing is establishing with greater and greater care that this is real, but nobody knows what causes it. What we've done, I think the greatest advances in research in epidemiology have been to rule out some obvious explanations. So um, you might think, well, you know, in a big city like, say, London, viruses are transmitted more rapidly, being, you know, so getting a virus, sorry? It all boils down again to the microbiota. Yeah, but it's not. <laughs> but unfortunately, it isn't. No? So, no, because there's, there's research that shows that um, risk of schizophrenia is different across different neighborhoods in London. 
uh, so in the very same city. Uh, you know, people thought, very important early hypothesis, maybe people disposed to get schizophrenia are more inclined to move to a city. So it's schizophrenia causes city living rather than the other way around, but that's not true. I mean, Fairly cries out for you know, urban geographer and geographer. No, I have been to Sao Paulo. There's no question that it's yeah. very different. From no, no, I'm sure it does. And it's very challenging for people to live there. They just live there. There's a lot of energy goes into dealing with the sheer magnitude of the city and how it's able to get from point A to point B. Sure. So these are. I'm sure you can come up with many, many ways in which this larger people view, you know, we are still indirectly with it. The fact that the president is impinging on you, ranging from the news at night to your general sense of safety to no, I, I, all kinds of ambient things. I, no, I'm sure that that's right, and there is very little research. I mean, apart from the research in London, there's very little research, in fact, no research on megacities. But as I say, it's going to be tougher than it sounds, because if the relationship really is linear, right, then you have to explain why Sao Paulo doubles your risk compared to New York, right? That's not going to be that easy. I mean, why Sao Paulo is worse than Burlington? Sure, no problem. Sao Paulo and New York? I don't know. Sao Paulo and Mexico City? I don't know. You know, I, it's, it's not obvious. Um, so there's a real problem here. And actually, uh, you know, that is one thing that we are working on. I'm working with uh, Saparna Chowdhury, a neuroscientist, a Daniel Weinstock, political theorist, and Lisa Bornstein, an urban planning uh, professor here at McGill, to, to do exactly this kind of thing, to try to get at a slightly more nuanced account of what city living is like from the point of view of the phenomenology of it. What is it like to be in a neighborhood, and how could that experience somehow affect your perception of the city? So, yeah. yeah. So, um, I actually collaborated on a large um, European instance study on psychology disorder. Uh -huh. and what we found is that we found this urban rural dichotomy. We found it um, in North uh, Europe, but not in South Europe. So, if you compared um, uh, the, the incidents among cities in, in Spain and the more rural area, there were no differences. So, I was just wondering if you, you mean thought. so. A city in Spain compared to a rural area in Spain, or yeah. city? You found no differences. No, there were no differences. Well, so, I'm astonished. Is this the big the study that Jim Van Oost is the head of now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what's your sense of where the data, what what the data show now? I mean, uh, so sorry. Let me just make let me back up. So you said you saw differences in Northern Europe. Yeah. As a function of population. Yeah, so there's this uh, urban rural difference and incidence in psychosis, especially in the Netherlands and in the UK. Um, but that was not clear in the end of So, again, rural versus city. Yeah. Right. Okay, so what's your sense of what the overall. So, if you added all this data to all the other studies, right, what's the, what's the meta analysis going to show? Well, there's a recent meta analysis. Uh, showing that um, in developing countries, again, this difference between rural and urban uh, incidents is not that clear. It's with, like a group of Gallagher, I think. I, I think it's a WHO study. So I just think that this whole urban-rural um, like difference is more complex than we, than we used to think. Oh, right. Well, oh, I absolutely agree with that. That it's probably more like a proxy for something else that seems more prevalent among um, northern European cities than uh, other places. Right. So I absolutely agree with that. Um, and so maybe I'll just jump to that issue, because that seems to me to get at what potentially is most interesting about this. We, have, we sort of have to end soon. OK, so, so let me, this will be the, no, no, this is, um, so this is actually a very good place to end. Uh, just one point. Um, so, so, uh, okay. So, so we asked the question, "What's causing this?" Nobody knows, right? Um, but what most people think, may, maybe you don't think this, maybe the new data don't show this, but what most people have thought is that whatever the phenomenon is, it looks like it's a social phenomenon. I mean, there is this kind of second generation drift hypothesis that's still around, but it looks like it's social. So let me just tell you very briefly about um, a study that I really admire done by a guy called James Kirkbride in London. And Kirkbride has been trying in various ways to look at what could be social about the causes of the urban effect. And he did this lovely study 
where he looked at different neighborhoods in London and used as a measure of kind of the social fabric of a neighborhood voter turnout in council elections. Right? You, know, you know the study, right? So he looked at how many people vote in their local elections. And he hypothesized that in a neighborhood where lots of people vote in their local elections, there's a big investment on the part of lots of people in that neighborhood. And in neighborhoods where they don't vote, people don't much care about the neighborhood. And what he found is that in neighborhoods where people voted, where turnout was high, incidence of schizophrenia was relatively lower. And so, of course, this is in the very same city. And it suggests, and there's other studies that suggest similar things, that really what's going on here is not just numbers of people, but something like social capital, the social fabric, the very, very complex series of social features of a neighborhood. Now, why do I think this is a nice wait place to stop because it seems to me that if we're going to be able to understand the urban effect in psychosis, we're going to need a theory, a very elaborate theory of the social life that might be interacting with, with the brain processes that lead ultimately to schizophrenia. And unlike the case of neurons where at least in simple neurons you can say, oh, it's red light, it's green light, you don't need a theory to talk about that. You do need a theory, a very elaborate theory, in this case, sociological theory of some kind, to characterize the context in order to begin to understand what's going on in the brain. So it seems to me another, maybe a sub-take home message here is if you want to study brain function, you need not just a theory of brain function, but a theory of the context in which that brain function is happening. So you need, in effect, two categories of theory, theory of the thing itself and a theory of its surroundings in order to understand what it's doing. So, uh, and moreover, there's a, a feedback feed forward here, right? So if you look at amygdala function or, or a PACC function, uh, not knowing something about cities, you're not going to be able to see that this part of the brain is interested in something to do with the social environment. But if you have a social theory, and in particular a more nuanced theory about social life, you could go and you could ask the question, what aspect of social life is, is this part of the brain responding to, right? So it's not just that neuroscience moves ahead and the social science runs after it trying to figure out what uh, brain functions telling us about human beings. It's that social science sometimes will have to run ahead first, right, and tell the neuroscientists what to look for. And then, so you get a back and forth between uh, the social world and uh, theories of neural function. And that, to me, is the most interesting feature of context. That context is a theoretical resource, as it were, a theoretical set of theoretical mysteries, too, that you need to begin to tackle in order to understand uh, a neural function itself. Okay, I'll stop there.